welcome to this evening's webinar, Make These Great Again. We're really looking forward to uh, having our faculty talk to you over the course of the next hour. And during the course of the event, we want to use this uh, platform called Slido to ask your opinion as a surgeon about what your specific thoughts are. So what I'll do is I'll just uh, display the uh, answer to the first question along with the answers that we've received so far. So uh, 10 people uh, have voted so far for 50% of those are doing 50 or so joints per year, 20% between 50 and 100, 10% between 150 and 200, and nobody above the 200 mark. Without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Brian Ufkenant as the head of Knee Marketing Worldwide. Uh, take it away, Brian. Good evening, and thank you for taking the time to join tonight. Uh, my name is Brian Ufkenant, and I'm the Global Marketing Manager for Knees at Corn, and I'll be the moderator for the webinar. Um, tonight is all about how we're keeping knee arthroplasty exciting and at the leading edge of orthopedics. Um, specifically, we truly believe that our patient-specific soft tissue data will empower you to tackle the knee um, you know, in ways never really before possible. Um, but before I hand off to our esteemed faculty, I want to briefly put this webinar in the context of Corin's overall vision for the future. So the agenda for tonight highlights the practicalities of omnibotics today and will provide a glimpse into the future. To begin, I want to return to a concept that is of growing importance, and, and that is healthcare value. It's one of the most discussed topics today, uh, mainly due to the introduction of new technologies. And the main question is, how can we improve it? Simply, we can either improve the quality or decrease the cost of care. And at Corin, this focus on improving healthcare value is really at our core. Historically, value within orthopedics uh, was coming from implant innovations. This example clearly demonstrates the significant improvements in revision rates as a result of highly cross-linked um, polyethylene in the hip. Um, but today, however, it's, it's fair to say that most implants are becoming commoditized. You know, companies have very similar implants because the designs work well. At Corin, we believe that the future improvements in value will come from the use of digital technologies. And the key to fully realize this value of digital technologies is to make them smart. So what is, what is the smart way to operate? Right? Smart is connected. We already live in an environment where everything is smart. Uh, think of your phone, your car, appliances, and why not apply the same to orthopedics? And now we've developed our vision around this entire concept, right? So we believe that we can revolutionize orthopedics by creating this connectivity between all stages of the arthroplasty experience. To do this, we're continuing on a journey of digital transformation. Um, this started back in 2014 when OPS uh, optimized positioning system was first introduced, and we've now complemented that with omnibotics for the knee. Uh, built on a strong foundation of clinically proven implants, we're now able to link everything together within a single portal of data management, and that is Core and Connect. These data are now populating our growing Core and Registry, where we, where we will be able to analyze these data and transform them uh, to actionable insights for improved outcomes and value. Uh, the predictive nature of these algorithms will follow uh, with the expansion of core and AI. Now, finally, it's important to highlight that this digital transformation must be applied to all stages of care and not just to the surgery itself. Now, at Corin, we are doing this and we can accompany you through your patient journey, starting from the patient profiling and continuing through the recovery um, with our connected technologies. You know, if you want to understand more about our smart technologies, such as Corin RPM, uh, please visit our website. So now without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce and welcome our faculty who will talk us through the practicalities of some of these stages. I'd like to introduce Professor Jose Romero from the Hirsch Landing Clinic in Zurich and Dr. Thomas Pashishnik from the private clinic in Graz, Austria. Uh, not presenting today, but joining us for the Q&A panel is Dr. Edgar Wakeland, our lead clinical research scientist at Corin. Perfect, thank you, Brian. Um, so what everyone will be seeing on their screen now is, uh, is another question. Okay, so there we are. So uh, we've got a, a real mixture. The highest answer is we strongly disagree or somewhat disagree with that statement, which is good, because uh, that means that uh, people, people generally do believe that these technologies can help them solve 
a lot of their unique challenging problems. Yes, uh, good evening. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining. I will see whether I can convince all those who do not believe uh, in the new technology. Uh, I will share my slides now. I would like you to introduce you to a new technology that will help us to predict balance and alignment in total knee orthoplasty. We all grew up with a very strict dogma of alignment and balance. We were taught the mechanical has, axis has to fall exactly through the middle of the knee. You have to cut our tibia perpendicular, six degrees of femur valgus, but we had no clue on how to assess the ligaments and how to assess the rotation of the femoral component. We wanted to have a nice balanced knee, but does this really go together a balancing, such a nice balancing with such a straight line. Is this possible every time? Freeman introduced in the early times already a tensor, a ligament distractor to achieve this goal to balance and to analyze the ligaments. But uh, these two gentlemen were too far apart and so that concept never really took off. Then Dave Hunger jumped um, into the scene and um, he said well let's make it easy let's cut the tibia at three degrees it make it uh, will make uh, our um, our life even easier since the tibia has already a three degrees um, inclination middle inclination so cutting it by three degrees it will solve the problem in flexion by removing the same amount of femocondyle sterile so then we will get this um, will achieve this trapezoidal flexion gap and have a nice balanced knee uh, in the stance phase. But people were afraid of a varus tibia because of uh, reports like that, that if a tibia is too much in varus, it will lead to catastrophic failure. And so the whole community went back to a, to a perpendicular cut on the tibia, but kept that measured resection philosophy of Dave um, for the femur and, and lead, leading to a trapezoidal flexion gap. And there are several papers showing that such flexion, flexion gaps and such unbalanced knees and flexion um, do, have, um, do produce problems um, in the patients. So there was an easy concept to solve this problem by rotating the component by three degrees externally to get the internal flexion gap. Well, this only works in a certain number of patients because if you, if you just look one standard deviation to the left and the right, we see that a lot of other knees are around going from six degrees of knee inclination to zero degrees of uh, the mechanical axis on the tibia. That's why the three degrees external rotation leaves almost one third of the knees with an asymmetric gap and all the other alignment methods for the femur also do not solve the problem. 17% still in, a, in an asymmetric gap and also the transepicondylar axis leaves in 10% the knees um, um, unbalanced. And then how to solve this problem? Go back to some ligament releases in extension flexions, but we know from several studies that the soft tissue releases that are being done for flexion have an, have an other impact on extension. So you cannot really balance the knee correctly for flexion and extension. And there are so many papers talking on alignment, alignment, results of alignment, and so few papers on the balance. And there is really a lack on knowledge on balance. The car industry, they have been known that years before us, that balancing and alignment really goes together, that they have to be assessed together, that they are dependent from each other, and they have to be analyzed at the same time and find the solution and find the best world for both alignment and balancing. So this is the new concept to assess balance and alignment at the same time. They are dependent from each other. You want to assess them in a real time 
you want to have a predictive tool to, to know what's going to happen with this balance and alignment in the patient. We want to assess it dynamically and we want to personalize balance and alignment for the patient. And this is the tool that we have for it. This is an electronic digital gap distractor. Two pedals that distract independently the medial and lateral compartment. It's put in the knee at a certain, it, it distracts the, the knee at a certain force. This concept of tensioner is not new. However, all the tensioners that have been around were rigid. They let us analyze the balance by distracting uh, the, the femoral component, then by, letting, let, by giving us information to personalize the external rotation of the femoral component, the chief uh, rectangular flexion gap, but they were steady. Even fancy um, distractors were all steady. However, this new balancer is dynamic. It assesses the knee from full extension to full flexion, giving the information on the giving the information on the ligament tension, on the ligament distraction to a computer. So this is how it works. The tensor is introduced into the gap. The knee is brought to a full range of motion. And the, and, and the, the, the instrument is collecting the data analyzing the alignment throughout the whole range of motion and the, the gap distraction from full extension to full flexion with a force applied to each condyle separately. And then the surgeon can now plan the position of the femoral component. He has now the, the possibility to predict the ligament balancing before to predict the ligament situation before any cut on the femur has been done. And you see how much impact with just a few degrees, here for instance, internal external rotation, a very few degrees change the, the ligament situation a lot. Particularly flexion, I learned how much the position of the, of the, of the femoral component in flexion extension changes the flexion gap. Look at this. We have two degrees external, two de three degrees external extension. Now it goes into flexion, and with, with putting the, the femur into flexion, you can close um, your your uh, your gap, your your flexion gap. The bone uh, sizing course has a big impact on the ligamentous tension. And once you're done, the computer protects the component onto the screen, and, and, and this is the final result. And then you can accept the final result. Okay, this is how I want my ligaments for this patient. And there you enter the digital total knee orthoplexy. From navigation, imaging, to real-time data acquisition, data processing, and at the end, it's the robot. But the robot is only the dummy part. The robot only executes what you are collecting with your tensioner, with your digital distractor in a real-time data acquisition. The goal of all this is to predict the balance, to predict a balance of the knee, to have a nice and balanced knee. Because if you have to answer the question, are patients more satisfied with a balanced total knee orthoplasty? then the answer is definitely yes. So the solution to that is the system that we will, that will show you later uh, in more into detail, more the technique. This is a whole system that starts with navigation to bone morph the knee with the, with the image-free bone morphing, a force controlled, dynamic, real-time feedback, of soft tissue balancing, you get, this, you get a, a feedback of the whole soft tissue, the whole soft tissue envelope throughout the entire range of motion. And then you can plan your femoral component in a 3D way, 3D manner, virtually, 
before any cut has been done until your knee is balanced from flexion to extension for an optimal stability and minimal soft tissue release. And these data, with these data, the robot is feeded and then the robot executes what you plan um, on, on the screen um, without having cut the femur. And the robot will cut the femur and, and give the result that uh, you plan virtually. Thank you for the first um, for the first uh, talk. Uh, we'll have uh, more insight later on in the second talk, more technical details. Yeah, Brian, thanks. can you take over? Thanks. Thanks, Jose. Yeah, that was that was a great introduction to the to the system. I'd just like to invite um, all the other panelists um, throw their webcams on, and we've got a bit of time for some Q and A before we jump to the next session. Um, a couple of questions coming in. Two are related. So the first um, I'll pose to you know Professor Romero and and Dr. Prashishnik, um How long was your learning curve with this with this technology? And and Similar question, how long does a case take? Uh, all right, um, it really depends whether you have already experience with, um, with tensioners. So I've been using, I've, I've been using, uh, doing my, my knees with a tensioner for the last 15 years. So the concept basically of a tensioner is, is not new. The tensioner was static. Now the tension is dynamic, and 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 it's it was analog, and now it's digital. So the concept is 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 the same. So this doesn't take too much of a learning curve. If you have experience with navigation, it takes you the five ten minutes. You will see later on five ten minutes to mount the, the trackers, and the the and and so if you if you don't have any experience, if you come from a from a femur first or from a bony landmark technique. Then of course, I think this will take some time for you to to uh, to adapt to this new way of thinking. Um, the cases take for me now about 10 to 15 minutes longer. Um, the mounting of the navigation and of course playing a little bit around with with the curves until you really get get uh, get your ligaments the way you want. But uh, it took me about two, three months to reduce the the the, the search time to uh, what I had before. Great, and, and Thomas, I'd be curious to know your your take on that, and then also final question, just about the workflow and how how strict you have to follow the workflow um, when you're doing it. I think mainly um, the point is that uh, the learning curve is strictly depending. What you're doing before, like Jose told you. So I think uh, I'm also using tensioners, especially from the Unity system before. So I was aware about the usage of it and the interpretation of the outcoming data. So um, I had the good luck not to have too long learning curve as well. And uh, the duration of the surgery now is from my side between 60 to 75 minutes, which is uh, an acceptable um, time, but when I started, of course, I needed about uh, 90 to, to 120 minutes. So uh, until you have everything, all the steps really incorporated and uh, just to be sure that you all, all do all the verifications and so on. But I think uh, this is not a critical one because it's, it's, it's pretty fast. I think the crucial one will be more if you change the, the implant as well. So if you come from another implant, you have to have two learning curves, one with the implant and the other ones with the system as well. For me, it was easy. I'm always using the Unity, so I had only the learning curve of the technology. Oh, that's great. Yes, yeah, so I know, I see Brian's put the other um, question up there. So I guess as, uh, the audience wants to answer that question um, like before. Uh, I'll just point out and get Edgar to uh, to confirm this, but I believe our, our data collectively has shown that the learning curve is about seven to 10 cases um, before I think seeing that drop from, uh, from a, an extended period of time down to what would be your, your normal um, expected time for a case. Is that 
Yeah, yeah, that's right. So when looking at uh, the learning curve, that time peaks at around seven cases, seven to 10, and then starts to come down again. Uh, but another point that's kind of interesting around that is around the accuracy that, that the surgeon can achieve. So even though the time may be increased as the surgeon is becoming used to the technology, that accuracy in being able to either execute what execute the alignment that the surgeon chooses, as well as being able to achieve the joint balance, that's not compromised during the learning curve. So at all times, the accuracy is maintained. Great, thanks. Um, so I think we'll, we'll probably leave this uh, question um, on the Slido app to answer, but at this point, we should probably switch to uh, Jose's second uh, set of slides. So again, this is um, the main goal is to predict the ligament situation and then to feed the robot with the data. Now we'll go uh, through this um, through this uh, workflow, and um, the goal is the, what? What's the goal of all this? The goal is to have a balanced knee, since um, we um, know we have learned. That the group of the unbalanced that the group of the unsatisfied unsatisfied patient belong to the unbalanced group, and then you have much more satisfied patients in the balanced group. So this is the main goal: to have, get a balanced group, and to abandon the dogma of uh, having a straight a straight uh, line uh, through the center of the knee, and to cut tibia perpendicular. And even even um, even if you cut the tibia at three degrees, uh, like Hunger did, and um, he emphasized on on a HKA going to the center of the knee. So this is being abandoned. Um, we look much more on the constitutional situation of the patient um, for the ligaments and also for the alignments, and are not afraid of um, ending up with a tibia and virus since um, it's been shown that it does not really have an impact on survival. And also if your limb ends up not with a straight line, it will not have an impact uh, on your survival. This is um, how the kinematic alignment works to respect uh, the constitutional alignment for a virus and to avoid soft tissue release and this is also true for a valgus knee. The question arises uh, where are the limits? Would you replicate the alignment of, of, of the right leg? The patient had this virus uh, for uh, over 30 or 40 years after trauma or would you like to replicate his alignment of his healthy knee? And if you do so, you still have a tibia at eight degrees of virus. So would you reproduce that? Where are the limits? Uh, what be the algorithm? And the Riviere is performing kinematic alignment, came up with a complicated algorithm uh, with all those degrees. Uh, I don't know whether he goes with that into the OR, but uh, what I'm missing here is a bit uh, the assessment of the balance. And that's what we emphasize on to give more importance um, to the balance. Um, in fact, none of all those uh, alignment methods assess the balance. And that's why we, the sophisticated concept is to predict the balance and the alignment with the new tool that will give you insight in what's happening in the knee. We call this uh, new alignment, the balanced alignment. And the concept, three important aspects. Number one, the tibia is restored to its pre-arthritic natural tibial inclination. So we start from the tibia, not like the kinematic line starting from the femur, from the tibia, we build up from the tibia, restoring the natural tibial inclination of the patient. Step number two is to assess the dynamic tibia femoral distraction throughout the full range of motion. We do not actually measure the ligament tension, although it's called the tensioner and ligament tension. But what we do is distract the tibia femoral 
gap in a dynamic way. And point three is a virtual 3D planning of femoral component position to personalize the patient's limb alignment and the balance that go together. So to analyze both at the same time, not first alignment and then their do releases and adjust the releases to the to, to the to the uh, to the alignment, but everything goes together at the same at the same uh, at the same time. So that's how it works. Um, first, the um, the navigation trackers have to be mounted on the femur and on the tibia, um, like that. And this this mounting on the on the femur will will also hold the robot. And on the tibia, if you have experience with navigation, the navigation trackers of the tibia have to be, have to be very medial, so to, to, uh, not to bother the balance spot, the digital tensioner that will um, be in front of the tibia. The hip center has to be determined. It takes a couple of seconds. Once this is, has been done, then comes the bone morphing. So it's, it's an image-free system and the computer will model a bone, the anterior cortex, all the different, all the different points are, 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 are digitized. And then you check, you validate the 3D model to be sure that the computer has, has a calculated a, an accurate model of the patient's knee. And then you take the knee through a, Take the knee through a full range of motion and you analyze the kinematic before anything has been done. From full extension to full flexion. You see that patient has six degrees mechanical varus, six degrees valgus mechanical alignment in this case. And the tibia is cut, as you know it, from navigation. It's mounted on. It is a very sophisticated tool with the three screws very accurate the inclination of the tibia the surgeon decides the inclination of the tibia depending either on his philosophy of a perpendicular cut or following the more constitutional situation of the patient by giving some various or some values to the tibial inclination and then comes the heart of the system where the balance spot is introduced into the gap and the knee is brought through a full uh, range of motion. The tensioner collects the data in a real time and projects it on a screen. And you see at the same time how the alignment changes depending on the situation of the medial and lateral ligament. This is how it looks in surgery. It takes a couple of seconds to assess the ligamentous situation of the patient and his alignment. And then comes the, un the unique um, feature where the computer proposes an initial implant based on the anatomy of the patient. So there's, a, there's now this compromise between ligament and balance. He chooses the best world between ligament and balance. If the surgeon thinks, I'm gonna give more, more laxity to the knee, or I don't like to have this knee in two or three degrees of varus or valgus, you can change this by your own, going into the screen interactively. You can make your adjustment to best fit patient's knee. And this, with that, you can predict your ligament balance. You can make your own changes and at the end the component is um, again projected onto the femur by the computer uh, showing what your end result will be. If you're happy with the result then the robot is mounted onto the femur to the same plate where the femoral tracker is so you don't need new screws and no new holes into the femur. And the data that has been collected is being sent to the robot and that the guide of the robot is positioning, will be positioned 
by the computer to the exact to the position where the planning has been done virtually with the with the balance spot with the with the digital tension. The surgeon leads the uh, the, the saw, and the robot places the guide to the appropriate position. All the cuts are being made in a very fast way. Here's it interoperatively. The surgeon leads the, the, the saw. And once you're happy um, with your cut, you validate the cut. Every cut, the distal, the interior, and the interior cut are being validated. Once you're happy with that, the robot moves on to the next cut. And at the end, the uh, trial component is put on the femur, and you can again run a final kinematic testing. And you see at the end what the result was, what the result matches what you planned before cutting anything. At the end, with the thermal, with, with components, with the real components on, you can again assess the, um, the leg alignment and compare it to the starting alignment before having done any cut. Jose, sorry, if it's if it's okay, but we're getting a lot of good questions coming in, and, and I think maybe some of your case studies right. can help answer those questions as well. So uh, it's good to see a lot of questions coming in, and, and they're getting voted on. So the top top voted question now is the most famous question, which is what distraction forces are applied? And maybe Thomas, if you want to take that one first, because you're uh, you're smiling, and then we'll we'll go to uh, Jose. Yeah, sorry, sorry for smiling a little bit because this is a never-ending story uh, between us discussing that because uh, I'm coming from the lower end. So my tension is very low, so I use the lowest possible ones with 50 newton. Uh, this is my concept because I try to avoid any over-tensioning. For me, stability is just the minimum stable situation I want to, to gain. And so 50 is more than enough for me. But I know this is a highly discussed topic. Um, well, Thomas is very modest because um, he actually has, um, I would say, the most reliable data he collected with his um, cadaver study he's done. So I uh, think he is really the, um, the expert on that because he has collected data in you know, order talk what he's talking about. Um, from my experience with uh, using other tensioners, particularly the hydraulic tensioner, I was using this uh, at um, 80 and 100 Newton. That, I think, was too much at that time. We're now using it at 80 in extension and 60 in flexion with the, uh, with the, with the tensioner, just to have the stability the necessary stability so that the knee is not falling apart during the during the assessment. And my question to Thomas is: um, If you're applying uh, such a low force, I mean, can you go? If you do, if you do it statically, I I, I can understand. If you do it dynamically with the balance spot, do you still get enough enough uh, stability that the knee doesn't doesn't fall out of the, the balance? I think mainly the question is how to proceed the movement. Uh, you know, if you're just pushing, it's different than you're pulling. So we use an electric leg holder, which is going up, and I slightly hold the, the back foot in my hand with a slight tension in it. So this is enough. But there is definitely, I totally agree, there is a difference if you push the, the, the leg in, in flexion, then you have different forces. But when we look at the normal gait uh, procedure, we have a loading and the unloading phase. 
And in the loading phase, we need only as much stability to avoid deviation of the joint to the side. And this is the minimum one. I'm only li a little bit about some uh, damage on the proprioceptive structures uh, because what we have seen, and uh, later on I can show you a little bit about my procedure, about the soft tissue envelope, that definitely an overtension, and I don't, don't talk about 80 Newton, I think this is in a more or less acceptable range, but I'm talking about 100, 120, up to 200, which was done in the past, there is definitely an effect of the proprioceptive uh, abilities, and that makes definitely a difference in the post-op treatment. So I think this is a, a personal decision which uh, which tension you use. I think mainly you should be, feel comfortable with it. For me, I feel comfortable with low due to the to the cadaver studies we did. And believe me, the lowest tension we need just to gain stability was 50 Newton on each side, so in totally 30 which are uh, very astonishing to a lot of people. But if you look at the literature, there are more and more upcoming uh, uh, papers about it, like Manning and, and others uh, who say that lower tension is maybe enough. But, uh, you know, it's, it's just a, a matter of your personal, it's a, a personal decision how to proceed. It's the same with alignment. You can follow the normal mechanical alignment. You can go for a kinematic alignment. At the end, there are all concepts a kind of uh, of success because everyone, if you ask him, will have a satisfied patients. So, I teach say there are many ways to kill a cat. No, that's that's great. I think that there's a lot of more questions coming in um, with regards to that and different preferences and targets. Um, I think I think you've touched on the workflow um, nicely in the previous presentation, Jose. Um, but let's um, I think we'll now go and have a sneak peek of the future and see how, how Thomas is is incorporating this omnibotics with uh, the bigger picture of overall patient care, um, and then we can come back to more of these detailed questions in the final Q and A. Before we jump straight ahead, just uh, to you a bit of an idea from some of the data that we have at Corum. So certainly I agree that uh, the, the force that's selected may be surgeon dependent on what they're comfortable with, as well as it may be patient dependent on the, on the individual properties of their soft tissue. Uh, we have generally found that a starting point of 80 Newtons in extension and 80 Newtons in flexion is a good place to start. We've certainly seen a lot of spread going from 50 Newtons up to 100 Newtons uh, uh, within uh, various So 1880 seems like a good place to start, but certainly uh, there's room for variation there. Yeah, excellent. We could have a three hour webinar, I think, just having this discussion around the forces, which is, which is fun. Thank you very much. Uh, mainly the point is uh, what we are doing is we're treating individuals. And uh, I think one of the goals is that we can try to find the proper individual situation for the patient. And uh, I just want to, to present my idea about it uh, by the use of uh, different technical support. So we are always uh, confronted with the demands and expectations of patients, but uh, the reality is sometimes far away from that. So uh, when we look at the available options, we have a lot of pre-op planning tools. We have intraoperative navigation system, which helps us just to look for the alignment, a sensor pressure measurement, just to have an idea about the loads uh, which are really applied during movement. We have PSI just to have an individualized uh, uh, correction of the bone. And my procedure in the past was very easy. I just had a pre-op plan, how to perform it, a manual balancing with the equibalance system and I use just single use uh, navigation tools just to have the alignment I want to achieve. Postoperative, we just initiated in the last three years a special kind of foster rehabilitation which is just guided on one hand by the patient reported outcome measurements and on the other hand uh, uh, really nice information about the muscle ability uh, added by gait and load distribution analysis, 
and we just uh, perform these uh, examinations uh, during the first stage of the recovery uh, from pre-post-op, three weeks, six weeks, three months, and one year. And we repeated it after two and three years to have a little bit more uh, long-term results as well. So now we have up to three years status out of these patients. My present standard is that we still look at these individual muscle activity and ability where we can measure how the patient is able to stabilize the knee and to perform uh, walking and walking up the stairs and so on. We also look uh, at uh, the gait procedure and at the load distribution. Intraoperatively, I try to uh, reach the target zone by the use of the Omni system. And postoperatively, we continue the variation um, in case of muscle activity and ability, also gate and load distribution analysis, and we try to follow a standardized protocol that we are really able to compare it. So the preoperative data assessment, uh, which is shown here, is just a muscle um, activity assessment, which is done uh, by using some uh, standardized protocols against resistance. And of course, during walking procedure, where you see on the right uh, bottom side, where we have an avatar where we can see how the walking procedure is done. Beside that, we see the different activity levels of the muscles, and we, saw the, we see the load distribution and can compare it before and after. This is very important because uh, this has also really an impact on my decision how to proceed in the surgery. So uh, we try to make really an individual evaluation about the patient's condition. We just look the x-rays, we just look at the pre-op data, and that leads at the end to a decision how constrained the, the uh, implant should be related to the achieved data. So how far is the patient able to perform a more kinematic uh, situation or is it only to be stable to have reduced pain? And the worse of the condition of the patient is, the higher the constraint rate use. We just look also at comorbidities as well as the morbus Parkinson. So this uh, closed circle is definitely um, one of the key messages I want to give from my procedure, that this is just really very helpful to individualize also the procedure. The intraoperative management, I think uh, after these excellent uh, talks from Jose, uh, nothing is to add. I just uh, use the Omni system. I try to avoid any overcorrection. The alignment concept is just regarding the initial situation. So I don't want to go from bars to valgus or in the opposite way. I just want to be nearby the situation before, also to the proprioceptive abilities and to the abilities of the muscle activity. As talked before, I just uh, use a very low tension. We prefer to have it a little bit lower, but this uh, is just one of the things we discussed before. Uh, and postoperatively, we just continuously monitor the patient and the therapeutic pro progress. So we just adapt also the physiotherapy and all additional treatments to the individual needs. So we have just uh, developed some kind of um, individual coordinative training, which is just uh, given also a visual feedback and the follow-ups just for quality control are routinely done after three, six and 12 months, uh, as well as after two and three years. When we see the first series, I compare it with a control group of 20 patients I did in the past with the conventional setup, I think uh, normal distribution, and I just had the uh, only group only up to six months at the control group we have up to two years and what we have seen is the army group to the control group is much faster in the improvement after two years i think it's very very similar and that fleets at at the end for the future i think the system is uh, one step into digital surgery uh, but of course there are will be further developments in the system, just especially for easier handling, uh, the Omnipod may be a little bit downsized, and as well, increasing the accuracy, uh, as well as the protection of the soft tissue well. So for me, it's the first step into orthopedics 4.0.
I feel it's definitely an improvement of the quality during the surgery. We have a much higher accuracy in the comparison with the past, as well as the individualization fact is definitely one of the key points. But of course, further developments are mandatory and would be highly appreciated from my side, but I think as well from every, from every other as well. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Thomas. That was, uh, that was great. Um, real quick, while the other panelists are joining, um, quick question just for you from the audience was if you use this technique for all of your patients. Yeah. All of this is a routine setup. We have started with the knees. Now we just uh, also do it in all hip replacements and all shoulder replacements. And uh, what we see is that it's definitely really a, a very high accurate instrument just to improve the quality of the post op treatment. Okay. And a couple, couple related questions now, um, you know, for, for both of you um, having to do with sort of how you prepare the cruciates or how you treat the cruciates and also how you treat the osteophytes and the general soft tissue. So the, the question specifically is, you know, how do you manage the osteophytes and then releases? Um, and then what do you do with the cruciates? Do you sacrifice them before checking tension or how do you manage that? Um, answer. Um, well, since the tibia uh, is being cut, um, then the, the ACL uh, then uh, is removed. The PCL I preserve, and then I, I do a first assessment with the PCL. Uh, the ostophytes, I'm removing the ost all the ostophytes before I do any uh, assessment. Um, and, um, and particularly the ostophytes in the back. So I have a curved ostophyte, um, and I really go after having cut the tibia, going all the way to flexion, that I can visualize my posterior condyle and I have a curved ostophyte and I remove also the posterior ostophyte and release the posterior capsule. No other releases, uh, and, and no other release, only a little bit the posterior condyles. Yeah, for me it's the same. I just uh, uh, remove all the osteophytes before the first use of the balance spot because otherwise you cannot really value the soft tissue tension. Um, what I'm doing, it's depending on the, on the choice of the implant. For a CR, a retaining implant, I preserve the PCL. But if I use a PS implant, I remove also the PCL before the first, uh, the first assessment of the data by the, um, by the balance spot. And the, and, the, and the system allows, if you then, for any reasons, having uh, initially preserve the PCL then you see that you have to uh, that you have to remove the PCL or because it's efficient or whatever um, then you can easily with the, with the unity system you can easily change from the from a from a CR to a PS and, re, and revalidate um, the the, uh, the the kinematics and the and the ligament assessment and, and go and start from there and use the PS that's great um, so first, starting question for Edgar, um, if you can reflect back on some of the early data analysis and explain the accuracy of the cut. So what is the cut accuracy? And then a question for Thomas and Jose, um, what's your experience been, how that relates to your pre and post-op? So your pre-op, or you're not pre-op, your pre-resection gap prediction to your post-op final implantation. Sure. So in terms of the accuracy, uh, we've generally found the system is accurate to within about plus or minus one degree and plus or minus one millimeter. So if you're aiming for a 10 millimeter gap, then usually somewhere between nine and 11 shows up. Now that's, yeah. that's pretty good because from our clinical studies into what correlates well with outcomes or what balance will correlate with outcome, we found that balance targets that place a limit on less than 1.5 millimeters additional laxity in both flexion as well as with um, uh, mid flexion imbalance can correlate with poorer outcomes. So certainly in terms of trying to target balance that is that correlates with better outcomes, this system is capable of achieving that. 
So I actually, was there, are you seeing that reflected in your experience from prediction to implant? Absolutely. Actually, I am um, just in, in the beginning, because I was a little bit afraid, let's say, to have my knees maybe too much, too tight. And then I could not um, react to that. So I tried to, uh, to aim for a millimeter more resection uh, to 11 insert so that I was able to step back to 10 millimeter to make really sure that I don't get a too tight knee. But now I abandoned this because, uh, I, because um, you really get what you see and what you want. So this is not uh, necessary anymore to, uh, to, uh, to account for that. So for my opinion, uh, one of the I think the most important point is mid flex, as you mentioned before. I think the accuracy uh, in this area is uh, strictly mandatory because uh, we know that a lot of uh, failures uh, in total joint, uh, total new placements are just strictly related to the mid flex. And I think, especially in this case, uh, the Omni system helps to be more in the a quiet range uh, you want to target and uh, what I've seen is that definitely the mid flex area problems are definitely reduced maybe most well, the, for the first time but from the system it works for, uh, you're right for the first time we can actually assess mid flexion like we for the first time we really know what what's happening and not when the patient comes back three months later but what's happening with the mid flexion during surgery or actually before we have done any surgery. So we can predict the mid flexion, the mid flexion laxity as well and, and, and account for that and react. No, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, so before we move on to just the summary slides and closing, um, can each of you, I, I know that the system you know, it can hit whatever target you aim for, right? So you can adjust your preferences um, as you want. But specifically for you, what are the limits um, that you follow for femoral rotation, uh, coronal alignment? What are what are your specific sort of parameters you follow? Well, this is uh, this is actually a pretty difficult question. You know, um, let, let's let's put it that way. Um, it starts with the tibia, right? So what, what, where is the limit for the tibia? And um, I look at the, I look, I look at the pre-op X-rays, and if he has, if I, can, if I can compare the other side, then I aim for the other side. If not, with the, we digitize the tibia, we digitize the lowest point, and from there I can, I can go up and and correct my tibial inclination and and i can give five six seven degrees of, of various of this tibial inclination that's very rare so i can correct my tibial inclination and once i've done this and the ligaments are are, are competent you will not um you know you will not have an, a, a, a catastrophic outlay so the, the the distraction will give you a pretty nice balance somewhat into flexion uh, into into various uh, values and then it's on you to decide whether you accept what what the, the system is proposing to you or you go a bit back on force but i cannot give you this point don't go further than five degrees of various or not i can't i cannot give you these these uh, this information yet it's still i mean the old concepts still are valid you know Although they are less valid because the tibia at five degrees of virus is not a catastrophic failure anymore. Yeah, for me mainly, it's just depending on the data that I just get before. Uh, I want to leave the range uh, which is very good. So, you know, when we just look at Bailey's angles, we have the BDA of, of 87 as well as the LDFA. This is just uh, the normal situation, but of course we have the counter side that we have a look on it. Uh, we have constitutional virus, which is just very, very common. I think uh, mainly my procedure just aims me that I just compare it to the other side, 
horrible if both are strictly affected, then you have to change totally. You have to look for. But there is also some details and facts we get out of the muscle activities. We see some overload or underloading from, from the muscles as well, which gives us some ideas in which direction action should be together also with the load distribution analysis with the position of the ankle as well. Um, I think all these facts can be summarized in a target zone and uh, I think this is also the point that you can just play a little bit where you can end, uh, end up at. The no, very good and just w while you were answering those questions another sort of very relevant question came in about um, you know how do you plan your tibial cut? So it all starts on the tibial cut, but what tools or guides are you using to actually plan that um, to then execute with the with, with the system? Well, you digitize the lowest point, and there is a defect, you have to account for that. And as Thomas said, look at the other side. If you can take the other side, then I would try to replicate the other side. Um, and on the on the on the X-ray, so I, I, I analyze the X-rays. I look what typical inclination does the patient have on the on the healthy side if I can use it. Um, if I can if I cannot use it, then I make assumptions. Right, I digitize the two lowest points on the tibial um, um, on the tibial plateau, and then I somehow see whether there is one, two, or three millimeters of wear. And then I reduce my tibial uh, inclination um, um, for that for that two or three millimeters of wear. This is uh, somewhat an assumption you have to make because if you don't know how uh, his medial inclination or, or lateral inclination he was before he got the before the knee got a fibic. Yeah, for my side, I just only still plan every case. So my digital planning software, I do it because in case of any technical defect of the system, I'd be on the safe side to have a backup uh, system. So this gives me just an imagination where I want to go. Uh, of course, you need to know about the geometric data of your prosthesis because this is mandatory how far you go because at the end you should be uh, more or less similar than before. So I think this is also an assumption of all these uh, details uh, you, can, you can get out of the pre-op uh, preparation. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. So just, I know this comment has been made um, in the chat box and Slido, but any questions we haven't been able to get to tonight, uh, we will respond to all the attendees uh, with a follow-up. Um, so they will be, they will be addressed. Um, but I just wanted to close with um, just a final, final thought. Um, so in the final few minutes, you know, we just want to return back to this idea of core and connect and the smart way to operate. And so as, as we've demonstrated, there are clearly powerful tools at our disposal. Um, but what the true value will be is in connecting them, right? So first, we believe that this will provide the best customer experience, single access point for all of our technologies. And secondly, thanks to the actionable insight generated from the core and registry, for the first time, the surgeons will be able to quantify how decisions made preoperatively or interoperatively can affect those outcomes. Uh, and then moving on the screen here is just a snapshot of this uh, of the Corin registry through 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 Corin Connect. And you can modify aspects of the patient care uh, to improve future patient outcomes. So to conclude, you know I want to sincerely thank you for your time um, for this evening. Uh, certainly thank you to all the, the faculty members tonight. We'll open the floor for any remaining questions for anyone who wants to to stay on and i wish you all a very safe and healthy end to uh, certainly what has been a year to remember so thank you thank you very much but yeah if there are any other final questions you know we're happy to stay on another were a few just technical questions on the system when the system was launched and and the data so the omnibot so the robotic cutting guide was actually launched and available in 2010, and it actually started as an open platform with various companies, um, and there's collectively over 50,000 procedures. Uh, it's since then, you know, we, Corin and Omni have now combined, and, um, you know, our cases collectively are closer to 25,000, um, but the balance bot itself was launched in 2017, and since then, there have been over 5,000 cases performed with the balance bot. 
So this is a good, uh, a nice poll question here. Would you be interested in the live surgery? 17, 17 yeses. So it's safe to say that either of our panelists would uh, would welcome visitors, although it's a bit challenging now. We are working on uh, digital tools to, to have remote visits for sure. Uh, question here, so experienced surgeons moving into robotics can rely on experience to confirm data from the robot. Um, how are new surgeons going to learn where to start? So if you're, so you're both experienced surgeons, what advice do you have for surgeons really new to robotics? I think basically the most important thing is you always must be able to come back to the normal procedure. Because if you're not sure or if you're just struggling about some of the data you get, you must be able to convert it to a normal conventional surgery. I think this is the point. Um, it's a very helpful tool. It's definitely uh, one of the most promising uh, systems to improve outcome and satisfaction. But basically, always you have to be aware about risks of technology as well. There can be failures, there can be a mismatch. It can be also the surgeon's failure because if the data acquisition is not proper enough, it can mislead you in the wrong direction. So I think the most important thing is just starting with robotics. And uh, this is not just critics on the system. Just be critic to yourself. If everything you're doing, if I'm always checking as well the alignment during with the all conventional tools we have uh, on our sets, just to be sure, just to be, for me, that I'm really self-confident to have the right way uh, done uh, till this point, and also to have the chance to start again when you're not sure. So I think the most important thing is just stay critical to the situation. Uh, it's technology depending on your input. The system, will not make a bad surgeon better, but it will help to learn more about the knee and really have insight how the knee works. I mean, I, I, uh, I thought I knew quite a bit, but uh, since I'm using the, uh, the balance board, I really, uh, I really learned more. For instance, uh, the position of the femoral component in flexion extension, how much influence how much impact it has on the on the kinematics uh, it was amazing so it, it's also a it's also a um, an educational tool to really gain more insight into the kinematics no, that's great well thank thank you very much i think um again just thank you to uh, professor romero thank you dr prestiznik uh thanks edgar really appreciate it. and uh, thank you to all the attendees for for joining. We have recorded this, so I'm sure we'll make it available and we will follow up with answers to all those uh, other questions. Thank you very Thanks much. For the Thanks. Thanks to all attendees. And, uh, Bye. Have a good night. Have a good and safe night.